So next we'll be looking at uh, the characteristics of class AVs. This is birds. There's a good representative of class AVs. And so we're going to just do, do with characteristics that are common to most birds. And obviously there's exceptions all the time. So we'll cover those if we need to. But this is just things that make birds birds. So first is their body form. They usually have what is called a spindle shape to them with four distinct divisions. So they have their head, the neck, which is typically very distinct in birds, some birds, very long necks, uh, their trunk, which is their midsection, and then, of course, their tail. Uh, again, necks are usually elongated, and they have that kind of S shape. So if you could put your finger on the beak there, and you could definitely draw kind of this S. This is very pronounced in some birds here, like this is a this looks like a dove, and other birds, not as pronounced, but some very, very pronounced. They have modified forelimbs, and those forelimbs are wings. And so their wings are unlike any other forelimb invertebrates in that they are completely modified for the purpose of flight. There aren't any kinds of digits or hands or anything like that. But they're, uh, they have feet, obviously, like you can see here really well in this bird. But their forearm is just kind of all fused together to make this flight structure. And some birds have a very large forearm, like this, this eagle. Very, very big, very hard, uh, able to stand up for flight. Their hind limbs are typically adapted for their lifestyle, whether that be perching or walking or swimming or uh, murder like this this guy here very well adapted claws and things so uh, as you can see and murder is not a good term for this this is just eating predation so you get the idea so you can see some of these here this falcon obviously uh, adapted for uh, killing things whereas the duck um, more adapted for swimming as well as like the albatross some have some uh, birds have these modified kind of feet where, like a coot, we have these around here. They can swim, but they're also good at just kind of walking around. And so the penguins, you see that here as well. So but legs typically modified for lifestyle. A little about their skin. Their epidermal layer is covered with feathers and leg scales. Feather is probably just a large modified scale. They have a very thin... A layer of skin actually that's covered by these feathers no sweat glands they spend a lot of their time trying to stay warm rather than cooling off uh, and they have a oil gland or a preen gland is what it's called at the base of their tail you can see this eagle here preening himself and what they do is they are covering themselves with this oil which again tries helps to keep them warm um they a lot of them do have i mean they have ears but they don't have a um an outer covering for their ear like mammals do it's very well reduced so they almost almost like just a hole in the side of their head uh so th the skeleton is fully ossified the skeleton has air cavities in it you've probably heard that they have um hollow bones sorry i was getting distracted by this over here they, uh, birds have hollow bones. Uh, this allows them to be able to fly, uh, gives them less weight. Their skull bones are fused. They have a single occipital condyle, which gives them a lot of range of motion in their heads. Uh, they have a diapsid skull, which what you see with the most modern reptiles. Uh, each jaw is covered, covered with this keratinized sheath, and that keratinized sheath forms what we know as the beak. Most birds have no teeth in that their beak forms this structure for them. Their tail is not a long tail, but they do have a rudiment of a tail. Their feathers, when we look at a bird's tail, what we are mostly seeing is feathers, of course. And their sternum, which is the bone that connects in the middle of your chest, if you can think about that, is very well developed and even pronounced. And the idea here has this structure called a keel. And if you've ever, uh, K -I or K-E-E-L, and if you've ever, like dressed a chicken or something like that. They you see this structure in there, very very well developed. And the idea here is to connect flight muscles. 
nervous system in birds is uh, across the board well developed. Some birds a lot more than others. Uh, enlarged cerebellum. The cerebellum is um, movement and balance. Think about you know, when you get up to walk across the room, you don't have to think about it. It's because your cerebellum has recorded all that and figured all that out, and you don't have to think about balance anymore. Uh, birds have an enlarged cerebellum because movement is as much a part of their lives. No matter what kind of bird they are, flightless or not, they still um, have to be able to move. And then some birds have very large cerebrum as well, um, as far as body mass or mass of brain versus mass of body. Some of the largest. Uh, in the animal kingdom, actually, this is the uh, uh, corvids like ravens and crows, my f some of my favorite animals. Circulation, four-chambered heart with uh, two atria, two ventricles, very similar to mammals. They have separate pulmonary circuit and a systemic circuit. Pulmonary circuit goes out to the lungs, gets oxygen. Systemic circuit takes that oxygen to the body and carries CO2 back to the lungs and continues that cycle. Very similar to our own. For respiration, they have some other sorts of things. They're not similar to ours. It's actually much more efficient than mammal respiration. They have these structures called air sacs, and they go throughout the visceral organs and the skeleton. And the purpose of the air sacs is to allow for one-way respiration. You kind of see this here as the bird inhales. The respiration is going to pass over this lung structure here. And it's going to pass into this air sac and back out the uh, the breathing passages. And the purpose here is air is going one direction in the lungs. It's not so in our own lungs, air goes in and then comes back out. It's not very efficient because our lungs aren't able to get all the air back out. So there's always this kind of stale air in our lungs, whereas birds don't have that. And so they're able to get oxygen much more efficiently which makes sense because they have to use energy so much in flight. This is a kind of a picture of that as well. You can see the air sacs here. They have a structure called a syrinx, or syrinx, and this is the voice box, and they use this for making noise. Some birds are songbirds, and they sing. Other birds kind of screech, you know, but... They make noise. This is for communication and, um, again, has to do with their higher brain capacity and able to communicate with one another, with, with uh, even with us in some ways. Birds can do that. Um, some of the most expressive birds are ones that we keep in our company or are directly tied to us, like crows, great example. Excretory system. They have a metanephric kidney. Um, they have a common opening for excretory and reproduction called the cloaca, which is familiar from the last unit. Um, they have no bladder, and so their urine is like this semi-solid kind of urine that uh, they, con they convert urea into a substance called uric acid, which is like a paste, and we're all familiar with this paste. They don't have a bladder. They don't. The purpose of the bladder in mammals is to hold urine for marking territory. Uh, birds don't need to do that, so they're just, you know, whenever they need to go, they don't really even think about it, which is why we see this sort of thing all over the place. Most birds have sexual dimorphism. Sexes are separate, and the males and the females are easy to tell apart. This isn't all birds, but most of them do have that, whereas the male is typically the brightly colored uh, one of the species and the females less. So this is not always the case. In some species, the male is the nest sitter and the female is the one out uh, fighting um, and has the more brightly colors. But sexual dimorphism does serve that purpose regardless of which way it goes. The more nondescript bird is sits on the nest, whereas the uh, colorful bird kind of distracts. And a few things I missed on that before we talk about these hatchlings. Obviously, fertilization internal, amniotic egg. Uh, and the eggs in birds are harder. They have these calcareous shells. Remember calcare, um, calcareous is calcium carbonate. 
Um, and the incubation of the young happens inside that egg, which is similar to reptiles. And they're hatchlings. They can have two kinds of hatchlings. They have altricial, which this is like, um, you know, the baby robins that are holding their mouth up the whole time and just need mama to feed them because they can't do anything. Uh, and if they fall out of a nest, they're basically garbage. So that's altricial. Very, they're helpless versus precocial. And these are birds that are pretty much able to do their own thing soon after they hatch. Like chickens are a great example of this. We use this term precocious to talk about kids that are very independent. And so you get the idea. Uh, like a baby chicken can start eating off the ground right after it's born. Whereas a baby meadowlark, like you see here in this picture, can't do anything without its mother.